This $600 Sprinter van now runs and drives. Oops. Ooh, baby. But how did we fix the no start issue? And why was it so damn cheap? So I was driving along one day, I got a call. He said he had a broken Sprinter. He tried everything, but just couldn't get it to work. It seemed like he needed some hot-headed, self-proclaimed Sprinter expert. Fortunately, I was available. So I get to the Sprinter, try a few tricks, pull a few fuses, click a few relays. Nothing was working. I was starting to think I might be in over my head a little bit. In hindsight, I'd overlooked one crucial thing, which was painfully obvious now, looking back. Before I show you exactly how I got this thing started, here's a few steps I took to figure out exactly what was going on. First, I decided to check rail pressure, which as you can see here, was really, really strong. This has to be done while you're cranking the engine, since the high pressure pump is mechanical. And here we got almost 400 bar, which is more than adequate to get the thing started. I was so happy to see that we had a nice, healthy, high pressure fuel system. Bar. Secondly, the RPMs while cranking were more than sufficient. It had a brand new starter, and the engine was turning over nice and quick, as you can hear. Now, notice as well, not only are we getting nice, fast, almost 200 RPMs or revolutions per minute, but we're also hearing nice, consistent compression for each cylinder. Notice you're hearing the exact same ver 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 ver. All right, this is a five-cylinder engine, so if one of them was missing compression, you'd hear you'd hear good compression ver ver, and the bad compression one would be moving a lot faster, so it would sound like a slightly different pitch. You'd hear ver ver ver. All right. Okay, so our engine is healthy, our fuel system is healthy. Next thing I checked was whether or not we had a healthy computer. So I checked the injection quantity while cranking the engine. What this is telling me is whether or not the computer is in fact firing off those injectors. I found here the injection quantity to be zero, meaning the computer wasn't firing off those injectors at all. So this was a big clue. All I had to do was figure out what was preventing the computer from activating the injectors. So I knew I was getting close, so I decided to check the camshaft and crankshaft position sensors. These sensors need to be synchronized while cranking. This is a simple way of determining that the crankshaft and the camshaft are both moving in synchronization, as you can see here. Now, when I did this test, I used a few scan tools and I checked it several times. This test has to be done while cranking yeah. the engine. And that's going to be an important Ooh. detail later. So, we tried this test several times, both with the factory scan tool and other high-end scan tools. And we always got the same code. That is a plausibility error. So at this point, we knew that lack of synchronization was keeping the engine from starting and or the injectors from firing. But we really didn't know what was causing that lack of synchronization. Could have been one of three things. Timing chain, camshaft, and or crankshaft. Now, fortunately, the timing chain, chain looked very healthy. We had no reason to suspect that to be the case. So that left us with two things, camshaft sensor and or circuit, or crankshaft sensor slash circuit. Now, the owner had already replaced both these sensors on a hunch. This meant we likely had issues with one of the circuits. Given there was an old stored code for a camshaft sensor in the initial report, we decided to tackle that circuit first. Unfortunately, this led us down the wrong rabbit hole. Let me explain. Notice here the camshaft circuit consists of three pins. We have one delivering power, we have a ground, and then we have the signal leading back to the ECU. Now, the 12 volt power and the position sensor signal both lead directly back to the ECU. We checked the ground for continuity with the chassis and it was perfect. We checked the we checked out the sensor was in fact receiving power and the power was good as well. Then we checked for continuity between the sensor signal and the power supply. And interesting enough, we got either continuity or near continuity within that circuit. This was initially concerning to me and I thought maybe we had a short circuit within the ECU itself. Now, even though I thought this was unlikely, we decided to address the issue and just put in a replacement ECU 
just for peace of mind. Okay, so I throw in a new ECU, I crank the engine, and nothing happens. Even though the new ECU paired flawlessly with the van, it didn't help it start. What it did do, however, was provide us with the final piece to the puzzle. When installing the new ECU, I didn't want to waste time cloning the old one to a donor. So instead, I used the Florida Vanman method, where we just replace the ECU itself, the security module, then we spoof the ignition switch with the transponder from the old key, as you can see I'm doing here. Thanks, Florida Van Man. Here's where I personally really messed up. While we were diagnosing the issue on the old ECU, we ended up having to crank it quite a few times in order to uh, confirm and or graph that synchronization between the cam and crank sensors. This led to battery drain issues because our battery charger just couldn't keep up with the draw. When you're cranking on a dead battery, you get all these communication errors between sensors and the ECU and between the modules in ECU and or modules and sensors themselves. So what ends up happening is a huge data dump of stored codes across the system. So the old ECU had dozens of codes on it. I made the mistake of choosing to only focus on the current codes and disregard the stored codes. Usually it makes sense to ignore stored codes as they can kind of be considered issues that have happened in the past but are no longer active. Well, it just so happens that camshaft codes and crankshaft codes are kind of an exception to this rule because they can only be considered active while the engine is running. Let me explain. Every time you turn that key, those two sensors check for synchronization. Whenever there isn't synchronization, you get you end up with a stored code, which I was initially disregarding, or that was it was somewhere down the list of dozens and dozens of other codes. However, when I plugged the new ECU in, there were no stored codes on that thing. So after cranking it a few times and noticing this one code pop up for the crankshaft circuit, I realized we had finally found our problem. So at this point, it was late, it was cold, it was rainy, and just plain miserable. I told the customer, hey, I'm gonna come back tomorrow and we're gonna get this thing running. Now the customer didn't wanna wait that long. So in the morning, I get this text saying, is one of these circuit wires supposed to show ground? I reply back, you're damn right it should. And that's what I knew we found our problem. So I suggest to him, hey, don't bother trying to run that wire back to the ECU. Just create an external ground that is straight from the ground on sensor right directly to the vehicle chassis. He did that and five minutes later, vroom, I get a text. Two words, it runs.